I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff real fast. I have a lot of pictures and slides, and um, um, I gave a, a different version of this presentation uh, the night before last in South Florida, and it was a little controversial. Uh, but I think with this group, it won't be. Um, so basically, our cities are changing fast. Uh, this is actually a picture of Chicago that sort of mocked up with some uh, enhancements that we made while I was there, a new transit station, the Divi Bike Share Program, artistic bike racks, and then some new vehicles and new wayfinding solutions and different technologies that are coming to the fore. Is there any way to dim these front lights? If it's not, that's fine. But that's how I'd ask. Um, so, uh, so every, everywhere that I go, nobody really wants to talk about the elephant in the room, particularly in South Florida, actually, um, because it is really um, a huge issue. Um, I spoke there actually in uh, August to a few hundred people for the Urban Forum. In over a few hours, talking about sustainability and land use, nobody talked about the issues in South Florida with the warning. And there's one big storm that's built on like shale rock, basically. Um, a lot of Miami Beach could go away. So these are issues that we really need to address. And we know what's happening. I, I was listening to uh, the TED Radio Hour a couple months ago. And this gentleman, the scientist uh, from England, really put it succinctly. I'm not going to read that to you. But basically, we're here by accident. You know, when, when the dinosaurs were taken out by the asteroid, what was it, 65 million years ago, you know, that created the environment. That we, so that we could be here by accident. And the irony is, just in the last 110 years since the, the Industrial Revolution, we have basically undone the environment, or we're starting to undo the environment that makes it possible to have our way of life. And people, a lot of people don't seem to understand that it's coming. And my, my wife works for the EPA, and she said, well, we actually did a study on the psychology of this. And we found that basically the majority of people, the way we're wired, can't accept that something that big and bad is happening until it's actually bearing down on them and threatening them to, to take them away. But we've also learned that there are other things that people will pay attention to, like economics. So, you know, the, the fact that we could all go away, well, maybe, but the fact that it's bad for business and can create economic hardship, people are actually starting to pay attention to that, and that's a good thing. Um, and uh, this is from Bloomberg, you know, which is a, uh, a business outlet. And, you know, there's no question, you can actually watch this and it'll play for you and show uh, over the last hundred years what's happened. There's no question what's happening. So I'm going to very quickly uh, go through some of the history of this country because I think one of the problems that we have is that people pay attention to the last 50, 60 years, which is the time that most of us have been on this earth paying attention to what's going on. But if you look back 100 years ago plus, things were actually quite different. Uh, for instance, the electric car, uh, this is in 1905 in New York City, we had 300 electric taxi cabs. They were NEVs, basically, like we had around the turn of this century, and they went 25 miles per hour, and they uh, went 25 miles per charge. So we had battery swap stations, and they were zero emission compared to the horses, so people liked them. <laughs> <laughs> but they had some problems, and uh, in 1907, the, the warehouse that had all 300 of them in it mysteriously burned out. Here's somebody collecting some insurance money. And, uh, and that was it. It was just an experiment. Um, uh, my friend John Norquist, many of you know who he is, uh, likes to talk about Detroit. Uh, he and I actually jointly presented to the Chinese Vice Minister of Transportation. And John was very forcefully saying, you know, don't make the same mistakes that we've made. And he put up a slide like this and he said, look at how congested the streets of Detroit are. Um, and then he said, Mr. Vice Minister, it's not congested anymore, which is true, although it's becoming congested again. But his point was, congestion is not a bad thing. We want lively congested streets, but we need balanced congested streets, not cars just filled with automobiles. And <coughs> cycling infrastructure. This was, uh, I think this was in Pasadena. And uh, Harold Dobbins, um, uh, constructed this cycleway, he called it, 
and he charged a toll, and I believe it was 10 cents one way or 15 cent round trip commute. Uh, it was completely private, so the idea of private infrastructure, not new. Most of our transit systems were created privately. Um, the sharing economy, it's this new thing, it's this new thing that's enabled by technology. Well, it's an old thing, actually, that we did in our cities around the turn of the last century when we had to, uh, or during the wars, when sometimes one mother would take care of eight families' children so that people could work while the husbands were off the war. Um, or, you know, great public spaces, um, common space, because people were living in tenements, living very densely, and they needed spaces uh, to share in the public way. Uh, and of course, packing a lot of people into little 25-foot lots. Um, child labor? No, kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep people on their toes. Because yeah. um, I know there's been a lot of wine about it. So, uh, uh, this guy, his name is Percy Neville. This is his fourth job. He's 11 years old. He's a messenger for Western Union. Um, and people use bikes for work. They use bikes for recreation. They use bikes to get around in basic transportation. And rush hour. This is a state, and I think, well, no, not state, state. Does anybody know where Sharon's taking? Hey, wait, yeah, State Madison. 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 Right. So rush hour was different. Now, you could argue this wasn't an ideal situation, um, but it was relatively safe. But you can see uh, the rise of the automobile. And in this slide, you know, we, we talk a lot about the, uh, the tension between all the modes. You've got ride sharing now, and you've got the taxis, and you've got the buses, and is BRT better than streetcar, blah, 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 blah. We had the same tensions back then. Keep in mind that in the uh, early 1900s, we had, I think in 1900, we had like 8,000 automobiles in the U.S. And by this point, we had uh, almost 30 million. So that's a lot of change really fast. Uh, and you can see this horse doesn't know what's going on. He's getting ready to run right into the streetcar. <laughs> and then you, you have an automobile there as well. And you have people walking the streets. People didn't necessarily just walk on the sidewalk. Times Square quickly got sort of overtaken by the automobile until our friend uh, uh, Jeanette Sadek Khan took it back. Um, and the streetcar <coughs> linked our neighborhoods together. In most cities, the streetcar provided a neighborhood to neighborhood connections. In many ways that we're trying to um, make up for now with bike share, because we don't have the time or the money to build this, the, the streetcar lines back. We have 220 miles, I think, in D.C. And we're just trying to get, you know, 22 miles under our belts. Uh, which is a multi-billion dollar proposition. Then came the Federal Highway Act, which was you know, a noble goal to link our cities and states so that we could carry a lot of um, stuff uh, and that people could go back and forth and foster commerce. But we took it too far and we started to destroy the heart and soul of our cities, segregate our communities, and sort of forever change face of our cities. The Levitts, whoever they are, made a lot of money <laughs> selling houses. And uh, the dream was to get that little white ticket fence, the one or two cars. By the way, these are only like 750 square feet, so you know, they, they weren't as big as the suburban houses um, that we have today. And of course, there were ramifications of all this land use policy that we really weren't paying attention to. For a brief moment, we thought, OK, the bike is going to save us, but that wouldn't happen for another 40 years. And in Europe, they really started to realize, like, whoa, we've, we've made some mistakes. And particularly in Northern Europe, um, you know, there, there were protests in Copenhagen uh, in the late 60s. Um, Jan Gell talks about this, you know, where some kids, well, a lot of kids started getting hit by cars. They paved over their canals in uh, the Netherlands. And uh, people started protesting. And they started to change the streets back and make them for people. But we have a different culture. This may also be LA, I'm not sure. But um, you know, this is basically now with everybody living in one place and working in another place. I think that might be Orlando. Could be Arizona. Anywhere. <laughs> and you can see that the economics changed in terms of how you know what people were spending 
for their way of life. It changed a lot. Um, you know, the dream of a house uh, became the dream of a car, maybe two, and now I think three cars per person in this country. Wow. So, what's happening now? The reason I put this up, this picture, it's actually silly, silly. but um, I was in Nashville and I spoke in a coliseum. Now, granted, we just filled the floor, we didn't fill the seats. And the, the last thing they had before me was a big wrestling match. Yeah! <laughs> and it was probably awesome. But <laughs> people are really interested in talking about transportation and land use and the economics of it and the health benefits and all the things, all the benefits of making better choices. And so that conversation is really happening and it wasn't happening before. So, that, so this isn't your picture view? Because that, no. That was an audience. That was summer view. That was, it's not as robust. <laughs> so there are all kinds of impacts. Um, and look, there's other reasons for some of these changes in our society. Um, but you know, in the late 60s, I think it's like two-thirds of kids walked their bike to school. I might have that figure wrong. Uh, now it's one-third, and 32% of the 33% um, walk. Nobody bikes anymore. Nobody feels like it's safe. Um, all this extra weight we have on us. Have you guys noticed that the seats are continuing to get smaller on the airplanes? And, uh, you know, we keep getting bigger and bigger. It actually costs a lot of money just in fuel. Um, so what else is happening? Well, the, the quote-unquote sharing economy has made a comeback. People are realizing that we don't all need to have one of everything. Um, people are sharing their homes, uh, cars. Um, you know, when I was in Zipcar in the early days, we tried to appeal to people. This is back when gas was $1.28 a gallon. We tried to appeal to people and say, look, do this because it's good for your community. Do this because it's good for the environment. Nobody cared. <laughs> I mean, the, the early adopters did. The early adopters did. The, the people that actually cared about these things joined. And there were about 800 of them. But then you had to go out to the masses. And so we got to appeal to people more based on their rational needs. Can you eliminate hassle for me? Can you lower my costs? Can you make my lifestyle better? We could do that with Zipcar. That's how we sold it, and that's how it became successful with public and all the rest. Um, and the internet is, so the industrial revolution that we talked about just a few minutes ago, we're having that revolution again. It's just in the cloud. It's just a different type of revolution. When you look at the Ubers and the Lyfts and the Bridges and all these other solutions, um, they're really just taking an old model and adding a cell phone to it, right? Well, a smart cell phone. Um, and eliminating people's privacy and security concerns, although younger people don't seem to care much about that anyway. And um, eliminating the middleman. Maybe it's the medallion owner or the hotel owner and so on and so forth. Uh, another great example is co-working spaces. I think when I left for Chicago, we had none. We may have had one. Okay. Airbnb is providing an outlet because they don't have enough rooms. 
And in Rio, uh, when they had the uh, Olympics, um, real quick, was it the Olympics? World, 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 World Cup. Cup. Airbnb actually partnered with the city to open up as many people's houses as possible and get a lot of people on this platform. Because otherwise, they couldn't have that many people there uh, for the event. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, so basically, we're moving from the meat economy that we've had since 19, let's just say 1950, to the we economy. And where people are getting a little freaked out is that you have the technology of the cloud and the internet and the smartphone actually meeting physical you know, transportation assets. And it's definitely stressing out governments and regulators and so on and so forth. But the cities are getting together. And if you can see my slide, it's a, it's a slide uh, that shows all the NACTO cities. And um, the NACTO cities. Oh, yeah. Command. Boy, I can tell you what's on here. We believe you. I think we lost power on this, too. Yeah. So, the ghosts are um, machine. I think when I joined NACTO a number of years ago, there were like nine or ten cities. And now there's uh, almost 50 cities that are NACTO cities. And that's the um, National Association of City Transportation Officials. And we're working closely with companies. Um, we've been meeting. Uh, Salida and I were in a meeting last week where we talked about autonomous vehicles. We're trying to actually get ahead of this stuff and start to get together and set policies that we can all agree on so that we don't get overtaken by technology like we did with the Uber, Lyft, Rideshare, slash TNC, you know, fiasco that now we're all dealing with. Because you end up with a divide and conquer type situation. And that's less than ideal. Is the command up? Vancouver on the top. This is actually right near the ballpark in the waterfront in D.C. on the bottom. 
but um, you know, re-beautifying our waterfronts, which I think really in some ways started again in, in Portland, uh, and uh, programming and letting pr the private sector uh, program as is happening here on the bottom. Actually, this is my brother-in-law who held a concert, an outdoor concert, mm -hmm. and my wife and the baby were over the corner. I took a panoramic photo. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, even in more rural areas, I'm amazed that you know people understand that. And by the way, I was on my bike when I took this. Going to my <laughs> I actually was. I'm not sure what it was picking up though, but um, I probably shouldn't be taking a photograph while I was riding my bike. But um, people understand that you know at 40 miles an hour there's a 95% chance you're going to kill somebody if you hit them. And at 20 miles an hour, there's an 85, 90% chance that they're going to survive. So there's a huge difference. That's why we have speed limits. That's why we need to enforce our speed limits. That's why we need to educate people to slow <coughs> down. Um, bike share systems, which have not been around that long, have exploded in popularity. And the B-Cycle is here. They have um, a lot of the market. And uh, you know, we launched one of the first large-scale systems in the United States. Uh, here in Washington, D.C., Capital Bike Share, with 110 stations we partnered with Arlington. We did it in 13 months. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it's now, I think, at 350 stations, and it's in three states. So these things really grow fast. I was in Miami uh, yesterday, the day before, the day before yesterday. Uh, they have a new city bike sponsored system. The uh, Deco bike system is now city bike. So people are realizing like there's actual money in this. You, you know, we sold a $12 million sponsorship for the Divi system in Chicago a year after we launched. So we got up and running. Then we, once we, you know, really kicked some butt and people loved it, then we sold the sponsorship for more money. The new systems, whether it's B Cycle uh, or like or the system here, they're modular, they're mobile, they're solar. Instead of a huge construction project like they used to be the first generation, now you can drop them in in you know 30 minutes and turn them on. And I think government's starting to realize, and something I really tried to push in my two jobs, that you can't just stick something out there and hope for the best. You really got to market it just like it's a private sector service. And the biggest compliment that we got with Capital Bike Share, when we do public meetings and show it off, we would have quite a few people say, wait, this is run by the government? <laughs> because it had a really nice looking website, it was professional. And when we rolled out Divi, we actually partnered with IDEO, um, who sort of, I think they, they invented or, or designed the Apple Mouse, and they're really a first-rate firm, and we spent some money. Um, but I think we ended up with a great service. Um, and this is my wife, actually, before the baby. Okay. Um, uh, also, government's realizing it can be playful and fun in its marketing, uh, and it can have a little bit of fun with people, and it can laugh. And um, so we had some really fun, um, we had the unicorn bikes out in Chicago, and, and we did that here for the Cherry Blossom Festival. Um, and I think people are also realizing that um, now that there's a critical mass of people biking, they realize, you know, it is a pain to just share the road with the car all the time. I need a separated bike facility. And this analogy, I think, um, helps car drivers understand. So what are we doing? So in many cases, we're doing on the cheap, you know, we're repurposing space. Um, this was our beautiful uh, streetcar. Uh, system on Pennsylvania Avenue. I think it's the last one that we had that closed in 1962, and that space has been empty ever since, basically. It was supposed to be a park, it was supposed to be a whole lot of things, <coughs> nothing ever happened. So I asked the mayor, I said, Mayor Fenty, could we put bike lanes there? And he's like, yeah, just don't screw it up. <laughs> then we screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> then we fixed it, and we ended up now with you know, this beautiful system, and uh, it was Earl Blumenauer that challenged me to put in bike lanes. And, and, and he was sort of like joking, like, that, this has never happened, but if you did this, this would be really amazing. And he was thinking we put bike lanes up against the curb. So me, not being a planner or an engineer or from the government, I said, but what, we have all this wasted space, let's figure out if we can do it in the middle. Everybody told me we couldn't, and it works wonderfully. Um, so don't listen to the experts. And one of the things that makes them so safe, one of the things that, well, no, no, we have a, we have uh, these little acorns now, all up and down, so you can't make a U-turn. But um, the line of sight is just amazing. You have the best line of sight in the middle of the street versus the side of the street where you're fighting with cars that are taking lefts and rights. Um, so in Chicago, 
You know, we look at some of our streets that have too much capacity, so people are speeding. People said we would love to ride bikes to work, but we would never do that because downtown is so hectic and crazy. So we um, took out a parking lane, made a two-way uh, bike facility, put in signals for the cyclists, um, and added turn lanes for the drivers. And guess what? The efficiency of the roadway went up. Speeds fell. They were still over the speed limit. And now people could ride safely to work. And pedestrians had less road to cross, so they're safer too. Um, even industrial areas, um, and, and by the way, this was the state of Chicago everywhere when I got there. There were no lane markings. They didn't have a lane marking program. They'd stopped doing it because it cost money. And there was a pension crisis. And I said, so what is your lane marking program? And they said, well, if somebody complains a lot, then we'll go out and do something. So just by adding the bike facility, you're rationalizing the space. We made it so much safer for car drivers. And the Milwaukee Ave bike lane is now the busiest bike lane in the United States. And we also looked at um, we also looked at public spaces. And, and the mayor ran one of one of the things he ran on was building the Bloomingdale Trail in Chicago, which had been sitting on you know people have been talking about it for a long time. So the mayor's like, let's stop talking about it, let's do it. And within 18 months, we had done the conceptual design the engineering, got the funding, and went to construction. And this is what is being built right now. Um, this is actually a picture from New York City. And I love this because, I mean, first of all, any visual is just better than trying to explain to somebody. But this, to me, looks like a place maybe you want to work. Like, that's about all you want to do here is work. Jeanette spent not a lot of money and put in planters and a bike lane and widened the crosswalks and took some of that car space and now it feels like a place maybe you'd even want to hang out, maybe you want to live there. So this does not have to cost a lot of money. And my big argument, sorry this is a, a Mac issue here, but my big uh, argument when I talk to people about um, this type of work is you got to get things done fast and you only have four years, really. You've got your mayor's term. And um, so I always break things up into two-year increments. And um, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. We had no money, by the way. So the mayor would say, do this. And I'd say, OK, what about the money? I don't know, go figure it out. And that was in both cities, but particularly in Chicago. So we had a piggyback. We, we, we did a, a whole plan for our, our, our bike facilities. And we had a piggyback on our um, striping and our paving program, because we had no budget. <coughs> But it still can be done. It's so easy to throw up your hands and say, eh. The Urban Street a, a Design Guide by uh, NACTO, put out by NACTO in collaboration with all the NACTO cities, has really been a game changer. And if you haven't seen this or you haven't, or your planners don't have it in your city, I encourage you to look at it. And like everything else, <coughs> like I was at ULI uh, as a fellow last year, um, economics drive everything. And the fact is, ULI is a progressive organization. But the fact that they could convince their members that this was good for business, it was good for their land values, made all the difference in the world. Um, and I think NACTO also gets a lot of credit for tracking that stuff. Now what's interesting is people recognize that the investment in infrastructure is actually key, right? Um, but the funny thing is, and oh, and the public transit and ped and bike infrastructure is super crucial but nobody wants to pay for it. And so what's interesting is the study also showed that, first of all, there's a gap between what the public sector and private sector think. Public is red, private is green. But we're not investing the things that have the biggest impacts. And they're the cheapest. They're the cheapest. Um, we're spending a lot more on parking, even though parking is going to go away. And I'll explain <coughs> my thinking on that. So this is a real problem. Um, I'm actually sort of hopeful, maybe with the Republicans controlling both houses, maybe they'll feel like it's their responsibility and, and they'll raise the gas tax. Or, you know, I've been arguing for years that if gas goes from $4 to $2, what if we just peg it at two fifty and take that 50 cent delta for as long as it's there and bank it? I mean, we'd have money coming out of our ears, but we've had the same 12 cents since 1992, and it wasn't pegged to CPI or anything else. So we're in this situation. Um, but again, this stuff is good for safety. That means 
people are going to want to live where you make these improvements. They'll want to maybe live in your city instead of out in the suburbs. And guess what? Retail and business goes way up when you make these improvements. Um, I think that fatality rates are also an important indicator, something to look at when you look at how your city's faring or how it's going to fare in the future. Now granted, DC has a very urban sort of, uh, I mean, it's basically a city, not a state. But still, we used to be pretty nightmarish in the 90s, like when Mary Berry was, was mayor. Nothing is Mary Berry, rest in peace. But when he, here, it, when he was here, it happened to be sort of low on the priority list. And people were greatly do 50, 60, 70 miles an hour down the arterials here. Um, so we're seeing a lot of improvement everywhere. DCs have the biggest. And we also have one of the most robust automated enforcement programs. We have, since 2001, we've had uh, red light cameras, speed cameras, and now we just introduced stop sign cameras. Stop sign cameras. Mm -hmm. And wow. you know what? Cool. They work. What's the stop sign? Um, so, in a nutshell, I mean, thinking about, you know, what's going on now, this is by far the most exciting time in transportation, I think, in our lifetimes. We're not going to see more change than we're going to see probably in the next decade. <laughs> I, I was on Block Island and, and took this picture. These, these people were laughing <laughs> at each other. But in some ways, uh, we can learn a lot from the past. And that's why I, I put up those pictures at the beginning. <coughs> Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Because the electric vehicle, for instance, you know, uh, Tesla's really doing the same thing. It's got a lot more advanced technology. Um, he had to revise this, by the way. He said, oh yeah, we're going to have self-driving cars by 2017. Then he came out this summer and said, actually, by 2016, and we're going to have some of the features in 2015 in our vehicles. Um, when we think about all this chaos on our streets, we're going to continue to see that. We're going to try to figure out what is that last mile connection from the, from the rail station. Is it bike share? Is the bus as good as it can be? Or are there other ways to run the bus that are a little bit smarter, that maybe make it more flexible, um, so it's constantly learning? Um, or should we be running the same fixed routes the streetcars ran? The whole idea of the bus coming and the way they sold it to us, they said, hey, well, now we're going to have all this flexibility. Right? But the flexibility never came. We just put a rubber tire bus in place of the streetcar. The streetcars last about 70 years. And the buses last about eight until they get overall, and then they last till 12. So nobody's making enough money on the streetcars. Or these new ride-sharing uh, companies and the fact that they're now doing carpool. How do we feel about them? Are they bad? Are they good? I mean, the fact is that a car with four people in it is more efficient than a bus, actually. So we get four people in every vehicle, and that vehicle got 52 miles to the gallon for the cafe standards. I don't know. It might not be so bad. Now, I don't believe this, but I think we do have to make our systems work better. Because the private sector is moving at hyper speed. And there's even a new platform now uh, that's going to go live in March and April in Washington to take on Uber and Lyft. The government has created a co op with industry and will be taking them on directly uh, and putting 7,000 taxis on one app and creating this co op. And every driver will be in the co op and will get a share of profits. So this is a very interesting model. I think a lot of the country will be looking at this, and I'm really hoping that it goes well and goes live. Sorry? Here in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And of course, there are people, this is something that we've been talking about a lot. In ACTO, there are people that are skeptical of the new technology. I think we should be skeptical of ourselves setting the right policy, but I think the technologies are all good. I think we need to get together as we are at NACTO, and figure out what are the policies that make these technologies work for cities. The technology is just that, it's a tool. It's not an end. So, thinking about how do we get from there to there, to have the cities that we really want. First of all, our DOTs have changed. You know, we used to have very simple goals. Move people as fast and as safely as possible. And now, um, really, we're thinking very differently. When Ram talked about Bike lanes, for instance. He always talked about jobs. And for him, you know, people say, oh, why is he talking about jobs? Because that's how he really saw it. 
He saw it as being competitive with Seattle with, with, and uh, D.C. And, and, and the coastal cities. Um, the fact is, you know, all of these issues are really what we are uh, addressing with our DOTs. But a lot of DOTs are stuck in the past. You've got to set aggressive goals. And so in D.C. and uh, Chicago, we set um, two-year goals with usually uh, 80 to 120 different metrics that we committed to hit. And if we didn't hit them, we would publish a follow-up and say we didn't do this. But we did this instead. Or we screwed up. But we'd be honest with the public. And the staff and the agency knew that we were going to do that. And they knew that they'd be publicly humiliated if they didn't achieve their task. And that also really helped to get things done. So we did a lot of plans, but they weren't like pie in the sky, fluffy plans. They were plans that were meant to be implemented in a set time frame. Um, and they are being. In fact, we're hitting the, the, the 100 mile goal of uh, next generation bike facilities that the mayor set will be hit uh, this spring in Chicago. The other thing is we came out publicly in a city like Chicago, um, which is known for being a very auto-focused city, and said, this is our priority. This is the indicator species of a healthy, active, safe city, is pedestrians on the street. We're going to prioritize them first, then transit users, then cyclists, then auto users. Because the auto users have been prioritized you know, by, by default for the last 50 years. And the reality is all these people are pedestrians. As soon as they get off their bike or out of their car or they're walking to the transit stop, they're pedestrians. So really, it's the preferred <coughs> mode. We all do it every single day. And so there's really a movement to start to redesign our cities around people again, something we did instinctively the first time we designed our cities. And you see a lot of this in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, uh, Montreal. Um, in Chicago, we had our uh, Make Way for People program, which activated alleys and parking spots. Um, and we did it in partnership with the SSAs, which are like our, our bids, and we have you know, about 30 of them. And basically, our job was to remove the red tape, get out of their way, give them some ideas, and let them go to town. And the SSAs and the private sector and the <coughs> architects donated their time and built these great spaces. <coughs> also, you know, the, the streetcar has become, well, it's not become controversial. It's always been controversial because it costs money. And people, a lot of people think that transit is the most subsidized form of transportation. It's actually the automobile. And, uh, and the, and the paving of our roads. But the streetcar, I'm very proud, after lots of hiccups, is coming back to DC. And it's not about moving people as fast as possible. People are like, well, why don't we have BRT? Well, in this corridor, I don't think you're going to be going 40, 50 miles an hour. It's rapid transit. This is not rapid. This will be going about 7 to 12 miles an hour, above ground, stimulating retail. And the development has gone absolutely haywire. And I mean that in a positive way on H Street. Now in the future, between autonomous and vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technology, um, what we view as transit, I think, is going to change. And the sort of profile of a transit vehicle, um, autonomous technology does not need to be limited to a car, by the way. It could be an autonomous train, which we have actually all over the world, including a new system in Dubai. Or it can be a bus. Um, there will be real job effects from this as well. But it gives us a huge opportunity to rethink the way that we use our city streets, particularly the wasted space. And, and something like 30% of uh, our public space in a lot of cities is devoted to parking and storing cars. So people are like, yeah, but it's not going to happen for a long time. Actually, that's not true. Um, the, I just drove a, uh, like a level two autonomous car in Germany. Um, the level threes are being tested, and the auto companies are building really the, the longer haul uh, vehicles here to go from the suburbs to the city. They're, uh, Daimler's building autonomous semis, and then Google's building the city vehicles. So people say, yeah, yeah, but nobody's going to want to have one of those. People love to drive. Actually, people, people, a lot of people feel like, you know what, my kids would probably be almost as safe or safer in an autonomous vehicle than with me, because we all know you're distracted sometimes, you're looking at your phone, you had the two martinis instead of one before you got your kid at school. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> some people probably do that. So, 
Um, and you know, Google uh, <laughs> purposely made this thing cute, like uh, like a little beetle. Actually, the bumper on this is made out of foam. That tells you what kind of vehicle it is. It's a city vehicle. It's an NEV, 25 miles per hour max, and um, no steering wheel. So it's not. It, this is like a level four fully autonomous vehicle. Cannot be driven. It's meant for slow, very organized driving in cities. And what people don't realize is in the city, it's not about how fast you go. I mean, many of you know this. It's about how organized you move through the city. If you move through in an organized fashion, you don't have double parking, construction going on everywhere that's sort of poorly planned, um, you know, FedEx trucks parked, parked in your way. Uh, it's a dramatically different situation. Some other good news is that uh, new cycling and pedestrian avoidance technology is in a lot of 2015 vehicles. It's in a lot of Fords, uh, Volvos, Audis. Some of it is, is an option. Like you can actually get the cyclist avoidance package on, on a Volvo. It's pretty interesting. I, I would think they just want to build it in. But um, uh, cars can actually sense when there's somebody there and will stop. And the car that I drove in Germany recently did that. So safety is a huge thing. We have 32,000 deaths on our roads, 1.24 million worldwide every year. It's the leading killer of people 10 to 19 years old is automobile deaths. Um, but in terms of planning, it totally changes our dynamic with parking. Um, and you know whether it's surface lots, although a lot of them are being you know, rebuilt as uh, buildings, um, parking garages, whatever, they're going to go away. And I, I think I have another couple slides. Delivery trucks um, are, are something else interesting. Not only can they be autonomous, but in Europe, like this is a real company in Europe that is now um, shipping things to the edge of cities, storing them in these vehicles, and then running them into the cities in these pedal trucks. Uh, and when I was in Deventer last year in the Netherlands, the whole uh, downtown square is closed to bikes even. It's only pedestrians. The deliveries are from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. Outside of that, you can ride your bike and walk. And then when you get outside of that, you're in farm country. And there's still bike lanes everywhere, even in farm country, which is fascinating. Even the U.S. Postal Service. Now, they're probably just trying to save themselves from bankruptcy, but they are. <laughs> but even they are looking at sort of drone-type autonomous uh, vehicles. And we've got to start enforcing our speed limit. I was saying earlier, and I know that speed cameras are controversial, and some of the companies that deploy the cameras, they can be a little shady, but um, the technology works, and I do recommend looking hard at it. Um, so back to parking, you know, with autonomous vehicles, we have the potential to get rid of 85% of our vehicles, and I know some of you are like, what, how's that possible? Well, think about the fact that cars sit 94.8% of the time. It's like the laziest asset we have. <laughs> so um, not only can people make a lot of money by you know, doing something different with their parking, including maybe making them into Airbnb spaces. There are people in New York actually looking at this. Um, <laughs> building zero parking facilities, I think the, or zero parking buildings, like the first one was in Portland, I believe. Um, I'm not advertising in Portland, but they have done some great stuff. Um, uh, this is a real project uh, with modular uh, housing being built, modular micro housing in New York. So one of the concerns people have is, well, that's great for the cities, and they're becoming very wealthy places, and poor people are being pushed out, and the poverty is moving to the suburbs. But it doesn't have to. It's actually a great article. If you Google Arlington, Virginia, salon.com, it's an incredible article about how Arlington, Virginia, the suburb of D.C., although relatively urban now, didn't used to be. It used to be all surface parking lots. Um, there was really nothing there in the RV corridor. Um, but used car lots. And they have added something like 30 million square feet of office space. They have more office space in Arlington than downtown Denver or Dallas. And they've also added a lot of density and housing around transit. And they've cut their uh, traffic congestion by 15 to 30% of every arterial, which is amazing. Uh, they have a great TDM program as well. But the fact is that the next generation, they just they, they, they don't care about the same things that we did. They want what Arlington has. They want what DC has, what Portland has, what a lot of us are focused on now. And um, 
you know, if your city or your town is going to be competitive, it doesn't have to be a big city. It can be a smaller place like Charlottesville, um, or a beautiful place like Boise, which I had the opportunity to go to not, not long ago. Um, and the solutions are not going to all come from government. So because I have the advantage of having worked most of my career in the private sector, for startups, I know how hard business is, I know how hard it is to deal with the government. And so I think it's really important that government partner, particularly with some of these newer companies, um, and give them a shot. Uh, you know, my food truck company I had in DC, I, had, I built electric food trucks before there were food trucks. And the, gov the, the government basically put me out of business after they asked me to start the company. They couldn't figure out how to sort of create the regs to make it su successful. And then I ended up running the agency that put me out of business. Which is <laughs> um, we're almost out of time. But you can't sort of ignore uh, what's going on with population growth in these mega regions. And I'm actually pretty hopeful um, that we are going to see high speed growth. We're going to see it in California. Um, and actually, we're going to see it in Florida. We thought we were going to get it with public funding. But I've been following this closely. It's coming. They're starting construction. And what's interesting, the Flagler family that built the original uh, rail system, <coughs> the Florida East Coast, the East Coast Railway back in like the late 1800s, they have a huge uh, real estate empire. They're selling off a lot of their real estate empire to build this multi-billion dollar uh, rail line. And then they're going to make all their money off the TOD, the, the big TOD I call it. There's like mini TOD, like you know, bike share station TOD. There's the TOD that we're used to. This is really big TOD, and they're going to make a lot of money. And it'll be very profitable. So it'll be interesting to see how High Speed Rail rolls out and what's the, what the amount of public money versus private money is. But I think both models are probably necessary. This is a picture of my new bike and baby. And, and I put it in here just because you know it's so easy to talk about all this technology and all this stuff that's going on. And the reality is we're doing all of this so that we can have you know, high quality, really simple lives. And I think we're heading to a place with all this technology where our lives are actually going to be much simpler. If you look at um, the way things were 100 years ago, we didn't travel as much, we stayed in our neighborhoods more, we grew our own food more. Um, you know, I have, I'm putting solar panels on my house, I have a very large garden uh, at my house that produces a lot of our food in the, in, in the warmer months. And congestion is getting bad. Like, I would never take a job outside of the city. Um, and when you look at our 2050 plan in D.C., it projects that things could be so congested just because the population is be so massive in D.C. that um, you won't be able to get to Fairfax in less than an hour. So you couldn't work there, or two hours maybe. And so I think we're, gonna, we're heading to a place where we're going to live, work, and play in our neighborhoods. We're going to produce our own energy in our neighborhoods, produce our own food in our neighborhoods. There's some amazing tech. In, in food. Uh, in fact, there's some big companies, well, small companies, creating big facilities here to grow uh, lettuce and vegetables in, uh, in aquaponic farms, same in Chicago. And then on the technology side, you know, I think we have a huge opportunity, and this is what we don't want. We don't want to create this autonomous world where we relegate the pedestrian to the same sort of third class status that we have in the past and just have cars zipping around. As, as my friend Robin Chase likes to talk about, we don't want people sending their empty autonomous car to the store for them. <laughs> but if we work together and set the policy that we want, um, we could have a world uh, that I think is a lot more pleasant than what we have now. Uh, so thanks so much for listening. Right on time, 9 o'clock. Five minutes of questions? Yeah. <laughs> All right. You know what you're to do? Yes, sir. Could you connect the dots a little more on why the autonomous car phenomenon is going to mean a lot less parking? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't think I finished that thought today. No. So, um, cars sit 94.8% of the time. Actually, I'm really glad you asked this question. And um, the reason that the 85% figure has, has come up is, is Google actually has decided to deploy their vehicles as shared vehicles instead of selling them to people. I and mean, that's what they've told us. And I think some of that is actually our input. So just in the last eight months, they've gone from thinking that they're going to sell them to the public to they're going to put them into shared fleets. That's a big shift. If we share these vehicles, um, so basically you 
when you're leaving here and it's raining, you decide not to take the bike, share bike, you're going to take the Google car. You just put up your beacon, it'll pick you up in less than probably 30 seconds because it's just there. And it drops you off and it goes and picks someone else up. So I don't know if people in cities are really going to even want to own a car anymore. Um, so the parking projections, I mean, you can look at sort of what year you can get rid of X percent of your parking, but you know, there are probably streets that in five, six, seven, eight years, you can start to get rid of the parking on one side of the street, and you can make that into a bike lane where you can expand the sidewalk. And so one of the things that we're talking about in NACTO is like, how do we think intelligently about this so we say very soon, hey, this is our plan for autonomous vehicles. When they come, this is what we want to do with that space. Because what happened, you know, 50 years ago, the streetcars went away, and then the cars just took over. The cars took that space. We don't want that to happen again, preferably. Here? Dave, you're awfully sanguine about the role of the private sector. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. We've heard about P3s for years and seen only a handful of them. What, what makes you so optimistic about the private sector finally getting into the game in a significant way? So, I've been very lucky. Um, I think part of it is because of my background, you know, to work with the private sector uh, in my government role. So like we did a design build project, our first in the district uh, on the 11th Street Bridge. And um, you know, I've seen design build projects go sideways because I mean, a lot of times government and the private sector just view themselves as like enemies, you know? And, and particularly in the contracting process. And it's like, it's, it's gotcha, you know, it's like, no, you owe me this much money, you owe me this. From the get-go of that project, we knew we were in it together, and we had to work together, or it could go sideways. It was very complex. We didn't have all the right-of-way that we were supposed to have when we started it. CSX was balking at where we were going to land the bridge. I mean, we were literally designing it while we were building it. Um, and uh, we met every week with Skanska and Pacina, and we sat for two hours, and we worked on it together. And I think a lot of what needs to happen is a philosophical shift. And by the way, it's not just on government side. I mean, the way Uber's behaved, for instance, period, the last few years, uh, they deserve everything that they're getting, uh, particularly from Portland and LA and San Francisco. So I'm not excusing their behavior. It's, it's outrageous. But putting them aside, um, there are a lot of private sector companies that want to make money and do good. And I think there's a lot of government that's thinking more about the return on investment and, and trying to be more efficient with their use of uh, tax dollars. So I think if we can change the paradigm in terms of how we view each other, and set up contracts so that we have um, the same, or we have uh, unified goals, meaning like, like if we want the bike share system in Chicago to market aggressively, <coughs> they didn't do that in DC because they had no incentive to, then we gotta do profit sharing. So the bike share system in Chicago we set up differently, and both systems work really great, but we said, look, we'll pay for the capital investment, We'll, we'll put up the 22 million. You're going to operate it, and you only make money if the system is profitable. So you better go out and market the hell out of it with us. But then, once again, we met with those guys. Actually, the first few months, every single day, we meet with them every week, and we work together as a team. And in some cities, I've seen that hasn't happened, and it's really an essential part of the process because you get to know each other too. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot more to talk about there. Um, but Uber is a whole separate issue. You know, that, their strategy of divide and conquer is exactly what we want to avoid in the future. So like when I approach NACTO about working on the uh, autonomous car project, I use the Uber Lyft fiasco as an example that we don't want to happen. And that we want to control the policy, we, we want to set it, and not have the big corporations set it for us. One more question? All right. Thanks so much, everybody.